Okay, brilliant. We're going to start. Uh, and um, so, th welcome to Scalato Parent Briefings, uh, which are short, focused, 30 minute sessions where we run around a topic uh, as quickly as we can. Um, and today, the question we're talking about uh, is whether to move out of the city or more broadly, whether to move to be near a particular school. And we'll be discussing the advantages and pitfalls of moving out of London. And it's not just about whether or not you can get good coffee. Uh, so to, just to kick the thing off, I thought it'd be quite helpful for the panel to know a little bit about the audience. So could you put your hand up if you currently live in London? OK, that's a pretty much dead 100%, I think. Um, and put your hand up if you're thinking about moving somewhere else. Yeah, brilliant. So we've, we've got a... The, the title has selected the audience for us. That's more or less 100% thinking about relocating. Put your hand up if you're certain where you think you might go. Okay, no one. <laughs> okay, that's great, because that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. And we've got a brilliant panel. So we've got uh, three heads. Uh, Sean Price here from uh, Western Burt, uh, Alistair Churnside from St. Edward Oxford, and Sarah Wilson from Heathfield, and Hero Brown, who's founder and editor-in-chief of Muddy Stilettos. So I'm going to ask each head briefly to explain where their schools are and the kind of, uh, yeah, just where they are, really, what, what kind of locations they are. So let's start with Alistair. Hi there, good afternoon. Just start by saying that I've, um, I can sympathize with all of you. Uh, Zanna and I, my wife and I with our children, we've moved out of London twice. Uh, once from the time where we worked, uh, I worked as a banker and moved to be a teacher at Eton. Uh, moved back into London when I worked at Harrow, and now we've moved back out again uh, to live and work in Oxford, which is where, where St. Edward's is. So just two words, a uh, few words on, on our school. We are um, uh, a school in the center of town, so we're inside the Ring Road. Um, we have 100 acres of green space, but we're only about um, 10 minutes or so on a bus, 15 or so minutes if you're walking from the very center of the university city. So we are um, a little bit of everything right in the middle of town. So that's the sort of urbane option. Sean. <laughs> Hi, um, good morning. Um, we are, so we're right in the heart of the Cotswolds. Uh, we are a through school with our senior school, uh, located uh, equidistant really from Bath, Bristol and Cheltenham. So in that kind of Cotswold triangle, uh, right in the middle of the countryside, um, about 30 minutes from each of those cities. Um, but again, a huge state of, of green space, heritage, parkland of about 200 acres, um, right in the middle of Cotswold countryside. So middle of means rural. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Sarah Wilson from Heathfield. We are in Ascot, so in Berkshire, within an hour of London, which means that our families do find that they have the choice. Um, we have the space that has been mentioned. We have 36 acres at school plus things like the uh, Royal Parks very near us. But also we have those options where families can consider staying towards London and commuting for their daughter to do that. So that gives another option to think about. OK, so we're not going to do too much on the sort of estate agent aspect of where, you live, where your schools are located. But we're going to start perhaps with uh, a more kind of educational uh, question, which is, you know, the, London day schools are notoriously academically focused and quite narrow. I mean, that is changing a bit now, but that is the basic characteristic. And an awful lot of children are crammed into prep schools in tiny London townhouses with no outside space and you know, frantically cramming for seven years for their 11 plus entry assessments. Um, would it be correct to say that outside the M25, life is a bit less pressured? I don't know, perhaps... Um, Sean, you'd like to kick off with that one? Um, certainly from my experience, I think so, or from the experience of parents who, who've made that move. Um, what you find, I think, with, with the schools in our area is that uh, there's a lot of through schools, um, and, and that end destination, that, that parson of the exam, the kind of conveyor belt, the factory, whatever you want to call it, is, is not the, the ultimate outcome, and actually developing the children and having a bit more time and physical space to do that uh, it is certainly a priority, and, uh, and the phrase that, that we've always used, which I think you know, kind of sums it up a little bit, is, is a greenhouse, not a hothouse. And, and I think that's the approach for us and, and possibly a lot of schools outside of that London area. Alistair, you've, you've done hothouses and greenhouses. What, what, what do you reckon? 
I don't think I would characterize any of the schools where I've worked <laughs> in the past or work now as a, as a hothouse. I think it's important to be clear about um, this word academic. So I think people confuse the idea of an academic school with the notion of a school which has a particular type of admissions policy. So every school is academic. Every school wants the pupils who are there to do the very best that they can. They want to expand those children's potential and then get them when they take their exams to fulfill it. And every school has high academic ambition for the pupils, and I don't know one that doesn't. What people are confusing that with, though, is an admissions policy which is narrow, which is looking just for a certain set of criteria to admit a relatively narrow type of pupil. And those two things are really different. So the school at St. Edwards in Oxford, um, we have uh, a really strong academic culture, and that does require a little bit of pressure. And you'll know this from when you've sat with your children when they're getting ready for exams in school, when they're doing their homework, when they've got a test on Thursday. A little bit of pressure is not a bad thing. What you don't want is too much of it and the stress that might come, uh, come with it and follow from it. And that, that's to be avoided at all costs. And the breadth of a school community, I think, is a hugely important part of avoiding exactly that issue. I, I won't, what I'm going to do is avoid passing the same question around everybody. I, I think we, two answers is probably enough on each question. Um, so I'm going to start with Sarah then on, on the next question, and then we'll throw out a hero as well, which is, um, do many parents uh, move from London to, uh, because of schools? Is that, is that, is that kind of like a, a central criteria, or is it the, the move out and then they look for a school? I think there are both. I think there is a definite lifestyle element to the choice. I think we've just talked about the different types of schools that are available and actually the breadth of the opportunity of different, slightly different types of school is there when you move out of London. And of course with that, um, the co-curricular offer that Alistair's just mentioned, that re real breadth that the schools give, that is certainly one of the criteria for the parents that we find are moving out of London. However, interesting question, what comes first? And I think for you as parents, it's to consider what is important to you as a family. You know your children, you know the type of children that they are, you know where they will thrive, but you also know what will work for you as a family. Do you want to be sitting in a car while you go to lots of different schools to drop off? Are the transport links actually very important to you? Are you commuting back into London Lots of the people who move out of London still work in the city. Uh, so all of those things come into that equation, I think. Hero, what, what do you reckon? You know more about this than almost anyone, I think. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I would agree totally about that. On Muddy Stilettos, we're not a school, clearly. We do school reviews. We're a lifestyle site, and we, have a, we do over 400 school reviews uh, across 28 counties. So, and our USP, actually, is that we're outside of London. So um, all of the schools, we, we've worked a long time with Teddy's. We've been into review at Westonborough, etc. So um, we know these schools intimately, so we can kind of help you on that basis. But we, yes, absolutely. It's about not only what your child is looking for, but what you're looking for. And part of the offering, actually, on Muddy Stilettos, we have something called the um, Best Places to Live. And we've just brought out our new one, top 250 places outside London to live. And as part of that, we focus on the best schools within the certain areas that we've chosen. The way we cho choose those areas are based on our editors who live there and they live and breathe it. And so we look at everything. So what is important to you? If you're really like, you love your culture, you like to go, you know, you wanna be five miles from a fantastic theater or you like the outdoor space, maybe you don't have to commute, but maybe you do. So we kind of, we focus on all of those different things. And I think it's just a really, I can absolutely hand on heart, having done so many school reviews, tell you that there is a school for your child that is perfect for you outside the M25. But it's only going to be a perfect school for your child if it also works for you as a family. So that's the one thing I would urge you to do, is kind of think really right around the question. And uh, in a way, I would say not to choose the school first. Choose the area that you want to live, like the, the vibe that you want to get from it. Have a look at all these commuter links. Have a look at what you want to get out of the area. And then you'll be able to find some fantastic schools within that um, you know, uh, you know, within the area that you're looking for, and just shortcut it. Best schools, <laughs> best schools guide, muddy stilettos, and best places to live. That's where you're going to find it. <laughs> it's my one chance to talk. I've got to say it. <laughs> <laughs> would you, um, 
with your readers, do you reckon, would they choose a house or a school first? Are they frantically on right move or are they the good, on your guide, <laughs> school guide? Well, it's, it's no mistake that Strutton Park is sponsored <laughs> top, <laughs> the best places to live. So property and schools, I mean, they just go hand in hand, don't they? Along with lifestyle. It's not one or the other. It's all together, I think. Okay, so imagining that we uh, have made this decision and we're thinking, uh, uh, you know, as, as you said, you know, you want to move out, you're not sure where. I mean, you've got like 200 schools here and the whole country to choose. How on earth do you focus? What do you do, Alistair? If, you know, you've got to think um, about why it is, you're, what you're trying to achieve by relocating. So if you're looking for a, a, ru a totally rural way of life, that's one thing. If you're looking to be not too far away from, from London, which is an amazing city. So London is unique in, in Britain as a place to, to live and work, and you know that more than, more than, um, more than anyone. Um, are you seeking to be uh, in a place which is, which is rich in culture, or do you want more of the great outdoors? So you have to ask yourself what it is you're trying to achieve in your relocation, and that, I think, is the first step to take. Um, and then beyond that, you've just got to you look at everything. So you have to think forward, I think, to what your family life will be like in the future. So your children might right now love the woods and the great outdoors, but when they're in their, in their late teenage years, they won't thank you for being in the middle of nowhere. So those are some of the considerations that I would, that I would put at the front of my mind in, in trying to make this decision. And in terms of kind of types of school in a particular area, I mean, should, is it, should you kind of like just look at, say, a school like yours and a school like yours in, uh, near Cambridge and a school like yours near Canterbury? Or, or should you kind of zoom in on an area and then look at a range of schools in that area. What, perhaps I'll throw it out to Sarah. Um, I think what Hero said earlier is really important in terms of looking at your lifestyle as a family. If you know an area, um, we have this amazing thing called the internet and we do lots of searches on it, you will not know what a school is really like until you set foot in it. So by deciding what's important to you as a family, by knowing your child, because also has been said, there is a school out there for every child. By knowing your child and putting that together with what you want in a rough area, narrowing down your search so that you can then go and visit the schools, I think that's how you will narrow down your search. You will definitely get a sense from websites, from reviews, from Mumsnet, from talking to other people, but you can only tell the essence of a school, the atmosphere of the school, when you walk in through the door, when you see the pupils interacting with each other, when you meet the teachers, uh, when you see the grounds and when you get the feel for actually everything that combines to make that school so special. Because we have the most fantastic education system in that there is a real range of choice. Alistair said earlier, every school wants the best academically for their children and I could not agree more. It's actually the feeling that you get when you walk in and everything that adds together to see whether it will work for you as a family. Okay, so when you look around the school, I mean, you get a really good picture of the school and the pupils and how it works. The thing it's kind of hard to get a sense of is the parents and what, and what they're like. And actually for a parent, that's really important. You do need to feel like you're gonna get on with the others. So, so, so Sean, let's go to you first. London parents, when they come to your school, how does it work? I think, well, first of all, all of our parents are wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, certainly from, from my perspective, we have seen this in uh, people coming out of London more and more over the last few years. So actually what, what makes that really useful for us is we have lots of people who have been through the same journey and therefore if a family, for example, came to, London, uh, came to us from London, we would be putting them in touch with other families who've made that same move to, to have a conversation, to, to look at what went well for them, what advice they might be able to give a year or two years into their own journey. Um, so I think if you can make those links with people who've done it, that's really important. Um, but I think independent schools in, in general will have lots of different families from different backgrounds who've ended up in that school in that area for a variety of different reasons. So, I don't think you will find that you will come into any of the schools and be a complete outsider and the only people ever to have moved from London. So um, I think the communities themselves will have a, a variety of different experiences and if you need help integrating into that, I'm sure all of the schools have got class reps or, or different systems in which to do that, um, but there will be people who have gone through the same experience in the community and 
if you need that, that will be there. But, but generally, I think the, the school communities will be welcoming and, and will welcome people into, into what they have. This is something quite abstract. Uh, I mean, have you got school? I mean, examples of where it's worked really well and ones where it hasn't. I mean, like, like you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we've got. I, I was chatting to a parent yesterday, sort of in, in preparation for this, and they. I met them at this exact event a couple of years ago, and it's everything has gone swimmingly. They've moved. The children are happy. The parents are delighted, and and they've had the most amazing time. And they did do a lot of prep, and they did visit a lot of schools, and exactly so. So you know, you get you get a gut feel uh, and you know we all would have been in situations where the two parents from have gone on the same tour with the same person in the same school and have come back with entirely different opinions so you, so you do get a gut feel for it and that has to be really important um, where where it hasn't worked so well I can think of one particular example is the the dream has been this sort of we're out of the country and what we really want is this sort of um, more country lifestyle and, and a holistic approach and, and all of these things but the reality is what they wanted was the same thing they had in London, but in the green fields. And actually, you need to, to make sure that what you want is what that school is offering. And that those discussions, those visits will filter that out and you will find the right one that has the right approach. But I think you need to, you need to be sure that that is what you want because it is a big commitment to make. I always feel like Hero's website is completely geared towards this. So, <laughs> just to re re remind you of the title, it's called Muddy Stilettos. And I always have this vision of something kind of... London, sort of like 30 something, who's you know been out clubbing for, for all the way through her 20s and is now kind of tottering across fields in, in the same pair of shoes. Um, That's kind of not that far <laughs> and so, not from what happened. So, the question I've got really here is, is does it work? I mean, do people, do people find happiness in this move? Well, that is my I, that's exactly what happened to me. So, I moved out of London. Uh, when my, my first child was two, so I started my breeding program out in Buckinghamshire from where I've got three children now. And um, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a fantastic move for us, you know, but I think, yeah, you definitely want to be part of a community. You, uh, you, you definitely need to throw yourself into it. Um, you know, maybe talk to people who you <laughs> perhaps wouldn't have talked to in London. You just got to kind of like, you know, sort of get on with it. The one thing I would say actually about the sort of school community thing, which obviously it's very important to be part of a school community, I would just say to you, have a little think about your own personality as well when you're looking at a school. Because, you know, you might be someone who, yeah, you wouldn't have a little chat with someone at the, on, on the sort of side of the rugby pitch and like have a little chat about your day, lovely. You might not want to be in the kind of joint parents and um, teacher choir or <laughs> or be sort of like harangued into the PTA so there's real sort of gradations of how much you're kind of going to be involved in the school and with the other parents um, mostly it's absolutely a glorious thing but uh, I, I do know plenty of sort of um, joint netball teams and things like that that might not even rock bands I think <laughs> some schools that you know perhaps is, is not for you so um, but, but in the, on the broader scale yeah moving out of London um, I think if you do all the things that we're talking about which is really think around what you want as a family now and also in 10 years time really importantly I mean just from my own point of view I moved to a village called Haddenham it's in Buckinghamshire and the reason we moved there was very strong commuter links into London it's 35 minutes straight into Marlebone. But also, um, thinking forward, it has fantastic bus and train links for children. So now all of my children get their own way to school and back. You know, I don't, they go into Oxford when they want to, they go into London on the train. You know, you have that freedom. I'm, I'm not one of these people who is having to drive their children left, right and centre, and I've got three of them. So it's, it's been a really, uh, that was an important part of our move. And I think it's just about you guys thinking uh, you know, what is important to you? Well, actually, I was going to ask uh, a, a similar question in relation to that, which is um, sort of how local to your school should parents be thinking of living if, if, if they're thinking of choosing a country school? Because there is a kind of horror that some, some parents kind of literally sign themselves up to kind of like mad drives across the countryside. It's a great question. I just have one thing. I'm probably not allowed to do this. Just to follow on from what you, you just heard about school community. So when your children are younger, when our children are younger, we walk them to school, and, and, that's, and that's exactly as it should be. And then as they get older, especially if they're, when they're in London, they tend to go by public transport by themselves. And the tube train carriages are, are full of children making their way to school independently. And that comes at a cost. So there's the benefit of greater independence for the children. But there is a cost in terms of your involvement, our involvement as parents in the, in the life of the school. And when you relocate, um, I'll come to the boarding question in just a minute, um, when, you, when you relocate, you get a little bit of that continuing through the secondary school. 
and that keeps you as parents in touch with the life of the school, which, you know, and somewhere between, between the extremes, there's a really happy medium to get a lot out of being parents at the school and at the same time for your children to really benefit um, from their experience there too. So just to answer the question on, on distance, um, boarding schools used to be um, properly national, all of them, um, international too, and that, that market has, has shrunk in size. So people don't want to be hours and hours of travel away from where their children are. They want to be able to go and sit in the audience for a play, uh, to be there for a concert, uh, to be on the touchline for a sports fixture. They want to be able to come to see the teachers of their children in person at parents' meetings. In boarding schools, they want to be able to come and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with the housemaster, housemistress. And if you're miles away, you can't really do that. So in all boarding schools, um, we've seen a kind of shrinking of the catchment, if you like. Um, and that's, I think, a, a, that, that trend is here to stay. Okay, so Sarah, um, how diverse are schools outside the M25? I mean, I think Londoners have a kind of sense that the countryside isn't remotely diverse. Um, and so, you know, you take it for granted in, in, in London schools that you'll have, like, a whole mix of backgrounds of staff, pupils, and parents. Um, and I don't just mean uh, ethnic backgrounds or class backgrounds, but LGBTQ and all sorts of ranges of issues that London schools just kind of are are that and is that true I mean if, if, if you're a Londoner who doesn't leave the M25 very much what's it like out there <laughs> <laughs> great question um, I can assure you and reassure you uh, that um, the reason it's such a perplexing question is because society is diverse and um, schools are no different from that we are a school which has local pupils. We have, um, as Alistair says, we have boarders who come from further afield. We are 18% international, so they come from all over the world. And within that, we have huge diversity. It's also integrated into every aspect of school life. So not just our pupil and parent populations, but our curriculum, our co-curricular provision, the pupil voice opportunities that our pupils have to talk about the things that they are wanting to know about, the things that they want to develop their own voice about, and that impacts our school. I'm sure all of the schools here today, you know, pupil voice is something that is so integral to the running of our schools that all of society, all of the issues faced today in London are mirrored in all schools, I think. That's young people across the country. And Sean, then, uh, I mean, that was reassuring, I think. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not just London that's, that's uh, kind of diverse and complicated. Um, London schools tend to have quite short days, and they work sort of five days a week for relatively short hours. Country schools seem to take up you know, all of the, your child's time. Uh, why is this, and, and, and what is it that, that schools do with all this extra time? <laughs> um, well, I think partly because uh, lots of our, our families travel to work, and therefore do travel into London or other places and, and being there at nine o'clock or three o'clock or eight or four is really difficult. So having an extended day makes it easier for, for lots of our parents with longer working commitments to be able to fulfill those commitments without the pressure of being back uh, dead on a certain time. And, and also we're, we're very conscious that family time is important. So whilst we have a longer day, it does mean that we get a lot more into that. So things like additional sporting clubs, whether that's you know, rugby, hockey, football, netball, or swimming. Um, you know, if you have a swimming club after school, it means that's one less thing that you have to do on the weekend, and you get a little bit more time with your with your children instead of doing that. So, so it's it's trying to wrap those opportunities into a, a kind of all-inclusive package, as it were, so that when you do get that time with your children outside of those longer days, you can spend it as you choose as a family, as opposed to trying to tick off boxes and get to lots of different sports clubs or, or various different things. So, in terms of what we do with it, sport is a big part, but equally. It's trying to offer opportunities that are uh, beneficial for the child, but not things that you would necessarily be doing in the classroom every day. So for us, it's a, it's a lot of outdoors and forest school opportunities or Duke of Edinburgh style opportunities, that kind of thing. Um, but it may be animation clubs, art clubs, music clubs, uh, trying to offer a range of, of things where children can either extend what they do in school or try something entirely new. Um, that, that element is, is optional, so you can use the shorter day if you wish, if, you, if you're able to do so. But if you have those work commitments um, that, that mean you have to have children in or you want to take advantage, you have the opportunity to do that as well. So it's designed to be as flexible as people need it to be, really. I certainly think if you're 
if you're a London family like we are, the thought that you could just drop your child somewhere and all their after-school clubs and everything happens in one place and you don't have to shuttle them around and you don't have to manage an au pair and da 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 is, is actually very attractive. And it's also, uh, I think, definitely true that, that, that keeping a child in London and, and managing their lives in London is, is very expensive uh, and, and that boarding is actually often cheaper than, than running a child in a London day school. Um, by the time you've added au pairs, clubs, travel, all the other costs. Um, so, uh, you know, I, would, I think that's a really attractive offer. Um, can, I, can I add one thing to that last question? It's a really important point about the length of a school day. So our school day at Teddy's runs from, um, runs from 7.30 in the morning when the first pupils go to breakfast and the first day pupils arrive. And some of the day pupils, most of them, don't go home until, until 9.30 in the evening and the boards are there all the time. And the, there are two big benefits from those longer school days, I think. Uh, one is that it's much more of a both-and culture than an either-or culture. So the range of activities in which children can be involved in a longer day is just wider. So I'll give you one good example from our school. Uh, we have one in four of our 790 pupils is involved in the dance program. And they're doing that alongside lots of other different things. But the second advantage of the longer day is the most important one. There's just more unstructured time for the children to be together, to form the close friendships and the and have the really formative experiences in school that will stay with them for life. And that, I think, is, for me, that second advantage is, is the, real, the real benefit of the longer day. OK, so we, we've got about five minutes for questions. Does anyone have a pressing question that they'd like to ask? Or not pressing question? Thank you very much for your speech, sir. It's really interesting. I have a question regarding the overseas students and pupils. What kind of support do you have in terms of the extracurriculum and the academic support as the language is, I think, the main issue for them? And what age would you recommend to start for the overseas students being in the band and in boarding at schools? Really interesting question. Who wants to go? Very interesting question. So um, in terms of the support that's available, that will start even before you join the school. And I think you will learn a lot about the schools that you're applying to through the application process. So are the schools able to give you that support? Do they talk you through the process? Um, do they invite you to either Zoom calls if you are already international or to come into school if that is practically feasible to talk to the people that will be supporting your child? Also, the range of support that is available in terms of additional uh, language support lessons. Uh, the pastoral care is a very important point of that. Um, really good question to ask. How many children are in breakfast on a Sunday morning if they are a full boarder? Because with the flexibility that's come in boarding with um, flexi or weekly boarding as well, actually to know how many children are full boarders and are going to be there all the time is really crucial to your child's enjoyment of that school. Um, and each school will have their own program to um, introduce the children when they arrive in terms of a buddy system, in terms of opportunities for you as parents to get to know the teachers um, and the other parents within your year group. Um, but they are all very important questions to ask at the application process so that you know what to expect. Any other questions? On, that, on the uh, how do you judge a boarding school question, uh, I, I think asking what's happened on Sundays is a brilliant one. If you want a really, really quick and easy one, if you're sussing out boarding schools, um, asking them what they do for birthdays is a really good one, because that often worries children a lot. What, what happens in your school at birthdays? I'm going to have to pass on this. We're a day school, uh, as the prep school. So um, the senior school is, is a boarding school. So whilst I have lived in the boarding school, um, I, don't, I couldn't actually tell you what they do for birthdays. So I don't know whether I've let myself down on that yeah, one. Yeah, Alistair. Strike you us get... off the list. Uh, wide variety. So uh, we're, we have 13 boarding houses. All of our pupils, boarders and day pupils, are, are in one of the houses. And birthdays are celebrated there more than they are anywhere else. Wide range of practice, uh, from the cake when they're younger to the glass of wine in the evening when they're a bit older. Just the one. Uh, when, uh, when children turn 18, um, Zana and my wife and I, we invite them to our house. We live smack in the middle of the school, um, and uh, we group them together by month or so, and we have the, the 20 or so children who are turning 18 uh, for a glass of champagne to celebrate together and with us uh, a real important mi milestone in their lives. So that gives you hopefully a sense of what happens in our boarding school around birthdays. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> 
I would just say actually one other thing, which is if you are going to go to have a look at some of these boarding schools, go and ask the children. I, when I go and do school reviews, I always meet the head. We always have a chat, you know, USPs of the school. We sort of get my head around that. We go and have a look around the school, and sometimes with the marketing department. Actually, we always go and talk to the children. The children will tell you without any question of a doubt whether they feel nurtured and, and you know, whether it's a laugh at the school. I think if you want to send a child to boarding school, you want them to have the best time ever. And there's plenty of boarding schools I go into when you do, the children just like, oh my God, it's so much fun. And, you know, maybe they, yeah, they, they do often will miss home a little bit at the very beginning and then and suddenly, you know, of course there will be a couple of children who, you know, maybe it wasn't for them, that's just natural. But very many of the children, they'll be like, oh my God, it's so much fun, we're doing this, that and the other. I you know, can't be bothered to see my parents on weekends, I don't know if you, if you want that or not. But, um, but yeah, absolutely, always ask the children. That's the, the nugget of truth in any school review we do is when we uh, pull a child aside and just go, hey, you know, who's your favorite teacher? Or, or whatever it is, you know, when you get that nugget, you get that sort of special thing that actually nails the school for you. So uh, we've run out of time now for this one. Uh, just to flag up that at 2.30, uh, all the schools on the panel will be at the London Choices end of the hall uh, where you can talk to them individually and get answers to your specific questions. Because obviously, you know, everyone has their own questions to ask. So uh, 2.30 down the far end, and there, there will be other schools from outside of the M25 joining them as well for a sort of relocation group think. Thank you all very much. Thank you.